uh, welcome everyone, uh, everyone to this uh, colloquium on uh, inclusive cities. Let me uh, start by uh, thank you, thanking everyone uh, who's uh, joining us. Um, uh, we're going to uh, be talking about about cities and about how uh, cities have been uh, developed. Let me briefly introduce a little bit the topic, and then I'll I'll give uh, the uh, word to the different speakers that are with us uh, together today. Uh, my name is Juan Montraz and I'm a, a professor here at uh, University of Pompeu of Economics. So uh, pre uh, the pandemic, uh, basically what we have seen uh, in the world is that uh, particularly in developed economies is a movement of production from agriculture to manufacturing and then to uh, services. Uh, and this has come together with an increase uh, in the uh, share of economic activity that takes place uh, in cities. Cities are particularly good for uh, workers working in the service sector. Uh, most of the services are both produced and consumed uh, in cities. Hence, what we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years is this big movement of economic activity towards cities, uh, and in particular to the large metropolitan areas of the world. Uh, I'm thinking a metropolitan areas such as London, New York, San Francisco, uh, Paris, uh, and uh, many others. Uh, on top of that, uh, what we've seen as well is uh, that this trend has even accelerated in uh, in some recent times, and that the good jobs are tend to be located in those uh, same uh, big uh, metropolitan areas that uh, I've been uh, talking about. Uh, there's ample evidence that workers in cities earn much more uh, than workers outside cities. Uh, and not only that, but also the wage trajectories of workers in these big cities is substantially better uh, than workers uh, outside these big metropolitan areas. What this means is that there are huge incentives to pay for living uh, in large uh, metropolitan areas. Moreover, in many uh, cities, particularly in Europe, uh, have been an increased demand for uh, spending time in those locations. And I'm obviously thinking about how tourism has been an important uh, component in, in many uh, places like Barcelona, Paris, uh, Rome, uh, etc. Platforms like uh, Airbnb and others have helped uh, this demand for tourism to really use uh, these cities. So what we can, uh, or so what we can summarize, or that we can summarize all these trends that I've been talking about as a huge increase in the demand for uh, living and using the space uh, that uh, cities provide. What this has translated into is obviously a huge increases in the price of housing, uh, which uh, obviously comes with many problems. Uh, in particular, uh, house price increases uh, usually uh, affect at least two groups of people, those who are living and are rooted in the cities uh, that experience gentrification and may feel displaced from their uh, uh, places of birth, uh, from their neighborhoods, uh, from their houses, uh, etc. But also those who would like to move into cities to enjoy the opportunities that, it, uh, that cities offer, but that cannot do so just because of the uh, high housing prices. The, pandemic may have changed that, uh, and uh, we're, I'm sure we're going to have some time to discuss uh, this. Uh, but what uh, the situation has led is to uh, many to try to find solutions to the problems associated with this displacement of economic activity towards uh, these big uh, metropolitan areas. And we're very fortunate uh, here today to have speakers uh, that have directly dealt uh, uh, or try to find solutions to the problems that I've tried to uh, highlight. So I'm very happy uh, to have uh, uh, present the three speakers uh, that we have today. I'll present them in reverse order uh, to their first presentation. Uh, so let me start with uh, Peda uh, Picorelli. Uh, he's a political scientist and urban planner. Uh, he works at INCASOL, which is the Catalan Institute for Land Development, uh, which is essentially the regional government corporation responsible for two types of policies, industrial and residential land development and urban remodeling. 
Uh, he's currently uh, coordinating, coordinating two programs uh, at Incasol. And on top of that, he has ample experience both in the public and private sector on urban uh, regeneration. Uh, our second uh, speaker is uh, Natalia uh, Martinez, uh, working at uh, Habitat 3. Uh, Natalia developed her professional career in the private sector. Uh, and in 2015, she joined uh, from the CEO Habitat 3 as head of uh, the Homes Acquisition Department. Uh, since 2016, she's also been coordinating the project uh, for homes for social organizations. Hence, uh, she can bring a very interesting perspective that combines both her experience in the private sector, but also worrying about social housing. Our third speaker is Rosa Panades uh, from, from the CEO Habitat 8 Impulse. She's a doctor in sociology, currently a project officer at Habitat uh, 8 Impulse, a Barcelona-based foundation that uh, promotes uh, collaborative and sustainable co-housing projects and works towards improvement of uh, the urban uh, uh, habitat. So Rosa can, uh, Rosa can bring both her academic knowledge in sociology and also her experience in the field uh, to address the questions that we've uh, been talking about. So with uh, further ado, let me give the floor to our uh, speakers. Uh, let me uh, start with, uh, with Rosa, uh, perhaps uh, asking a few questions uh, that she can uh, elaborate. In particular, uh, how could co-housing uh, projects contribute to further making cities more incl uh, inclusive and how can they uh, help uh, overcome some of the difficulties uh, that the raising demand for living in cities has created to many of the inhabitants uh, in these big uh, metropolitan uh, areas. Uh, so the floor is, is yours. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting us to speak and to give our, um, you know, our opinion and experience about sustainable and inclusive housing. Uh, so, in, you would like me to start uh, with this answering these questions that you posed, Juan. Uh, in terms of how co-housing could contribute to making cities more inclusive, which I believe was your, your first question, well, I'd like to, to say that co-housing projects uh, are uh, housing projects that are more accessible right, than, than, uh, than normal housing but they are not completely accessible to everybody. Uh, to access a co-housing project, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a private one or one promoted by, by the city council, you need to have a deposit, a certain amount of money saved, okay? That means that it is not accessible to people from, for example, like more like socially excluded uh, backgrounds, uh, from low income, uh, people who may have specific needs. And to make uh, co-housing projects more inclusive, what would be interesting for me is that the, the council contributes further to developing these projects. So for example, there could be programs where they have microcredits given to these people. We could have collaboration where the city council is the owner of some of these flats. And what would be interesting also is to collaborate with organizations such as uh, Habitat 3, for example, that works towards inclusion of people in, in, in housing. Okay, I think that is one of the, the ways in, in, in which we could make uh, co-housing projects more, more inclusive. They are generally inclusive, but I think uh, we are at a point in which they need to be made further. <laughs> you know, it, needs, it needs to go further into it. The other question that you posed, could you please uh, repeat? Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, perhaps you could also uh, sort of explain a little bit uh, for a broader audience uh, what uh, co-housing uh, projects of course. Uh, are. Right? Sure, I had it all prepared. <laughs> so first, look, if you want, I can start by explaining a little bit what co-housing Barcelona is, and then I can go into like talking about co-housing projects. So uh, co-housing uh, Barcelona is a housing cooperative that was funded in 2016 in, in the city of Barcelona and in the neighborhood of Poblano specifically by a group of uh, people who wanted to develop new, new housing models. 
and they wanted to encourage access to communal and unsustainable housing. Okay, they wanted to do this by breaking down the mentality, like the traditional mentality of seeing housing as an investment only. And that's the basis of our work. We believe that if we see housing as a commodity, as something to make profit from, or just as an investment, that is not compatible with making sustainable and inclusive housing a reality, okay? Some of the specific goals that uh, Co-Housing Barcelona has are building sustainable and healthy housing, uh, providing access to housing below market uh, rates, giving people stability over time so their what they spend on housing does not depend on fluctuations in the housing market and also promoting community life okay uh, i've said that co-housing barson is a housing co-op for those who are not familiar with housing co-ops not co-housing housing co-ops housing co-ops are non-for-profit organizations of people who get together due to their shared needs uh, of, of, of accessing a home and their desire to solve this problem. Uh, homes built uh, by, a, by a co ops, they're usually 20 to 30 percent cheaper, but also that's, that's just one of the reasons why they get together. Uh, co ops are democratic organization, and the way they function is in a uh, well, in a way that uh, members have to be highly active and every step and important decision is taken together, okay? If we now go to co-housing cooperatives, it's the same as a, as a housing co-op, but on top of this, there's a shared uh, intention to live collaboratively, okay? This means sharing space, sharing time, and sharing values. A co-housing is, uh, well, it can be described as an intentional uh, neighborhood, a collaborative way of living, that what does is foster social connectedness, okay, and breaks down individuality. Uh, in co-housing, people have their own homes, and that's really important to point out because sometimes it is confused with other collaborative uh, ways and communal ways of living. In co-housing, you have your own home with your privacy, your kitchen, and your bathroom and everything else that you need, but you also have shared spaces. Okay, these shared spaces vary depending on the type of co-housing that you have, but most of them include a communal kitchen and a laundry, okay? Other shared spaces could be a co-working, could be a play area. It really depends on, on, on the people because in co-housing, what's important to also point out is that it's the people who design their homes, their building, and the way in which they want to live. So they don't delegate that, say, to a group of architects. They work together right from the beginning, from day one. Okay, From here, there's social connectedness that starts from day one, as I said, and continues throughout, throughout their lives, as long as they're part of this uh, co-housing. Uh, in terms of environmental sustainability, co-housing projects are built with the environment in mind. So uh, choosing materials that are sustainable and building homes that are energy efficient. So I talked about sharing a laundry. So, you know, people don't have their own washing machine at home, for example, but others may include solar panels uh, or ways uh, to collect, uh, for example, rainwater and, and, and reuse it. So what, that's what, in essence, is um, it's co-housing. And we have two projects right now in the city of Barcelona. Uh, one is a private project in the neighborhood of Poblano. And we have another, another project in, uh, in Trinidad Nova. And that is, that's a public uh, project. We recently won a tender by the city council. And none of these projects are yet built. Building a co-housing is a long process. It can take two to three years. Um, and one is at the stage in which, you know, we hope that soon it will, the building will, will start. And the other one is at the very, very early, very, very early stage. So I think that's, that's in essence. Okay, so I, th I think those were uh, <laughs> many interesting uh, projects that, and I'm sure we'll have uh, time to, to get deeper into some of the aspects of what you're mentioning. Let me give perhaps the floor to uh, Natalia because uh, she's also working on related uh, uh, problems and uh, issues uh, with slightly different uh, um, uh, 
angles. Uh, and so uh, perhaps she can bring in uh, and talk us uh, and talk a little bit about the experience at uh, Habitat 3 uh, and uh, what is uh, what are the projects and uh, uh, views that uh, they're trying to bring into uh, thinking about housing and uh, particularly more inclusive uh, types of, of housing. So Natalia. Well, hello, Joan. Uh, thank you, and and thank you for uh, UPC to to have us here today and and be able to explain our our project. As as you both said, uh, lack of affordable housing is a key issue, and um, it it should be contemplated in in all the scope. Uh, many people that are not considered vulnerable or or excluded from society do have problems to to access affordable housing, and. Um, and we focus on, on the most vulnerable. And so we, we were fostered, Habitat 3 was created in, in, 19, sorry, in 2014, and it was fostered by the uh, Catalan Third Sector or Non-Lucrative uh, Board, which is La, la Taula d'Entitats del Tercer Sector, uh, as identifying a need for a providing uh, provider and manager of uh, properties to be able to make them available for social organizations that uh, work with people that have uh, uh, that are excluded or have uh, vulnerable situations. So basically, uh, Habitat 3 is a non-lucrative property manager, and, and that's the reason uh, we, we were born. So um, we work together with both social organizations and, and city councils and other public administrations, and um, we, we provide them with housing and we manage the housing so they, uh, they can carry on their projects. Um, in, in the programs we have with city councils, we also provide the support for the tenants. And uh, in, in the programs we have with other social organizations, these provide the support for the tenants. Because one, one of the keys to our, to our work is that we understand that uh, having an affordable, decent home is the first step for, for inclusion and for being able to develop uh, uh, the autonomy to, to, to get included in society. It's not that we include people, but people uh, develop to, to include themselves. Uh, but even being more, very important is not sufficient and, and oftentimes people need uh, specialized support to be able to keep the home, to be able to um, maintain it, uh, uh, fulfill the duties and the uh, rights of, of every tenancy. That's, um, that's what we work in, these, uh, in this partnership with social uh, organizations and, and city councils. They identify the need for our homes and they design the people, they define the people that are going to be our tenants. So we do not choose our tenants and we do not uh, answer direct requests from private tenants that may need a home. And that's basically because we understand that um, city councils have worked to identify the need and they have systems to um, define the eligibility of, of people to access uh, uh, homes that have an inherent housing benefit. So uh, in, in our homes, people pay uh, according to their income, not according to the price of the, uh, of the apartment. So oftentimes, uh, uh, mostly in, in the city council programs, the city council um, provides this gap between the cost of the apartment and, and what tenants uh, actually actually pay. So our, our idea is, is basically to empower people through housing and support their way into being autonomous and, and being socially included. And in our almost six years of existence, uh, we are housing currently uh 600 uh, sorry 1600 people 160 live in our in our homes and we are managing 600 homes which is which is not bad for for six years of, of uh, work um how how we go about it or how we do it uh when we started we we started from zero so we have no we had no apartments we we try to to develop uh, agreements with uh, financial institutions that had come to have uh, housing because of foreclosures on, on the mortgage crisis. Uh, but we have to say that we were not very successful with that. We, didn't, uh, we were not able to secure leases. We thought that since banks were not 
um, real estate agencies or, or property managers that we they would welcome someone who could put these homes to a good use. Uh, but we were not very successful with, with that. Uh, and, and we were very successful with private owners, uh, people that had empty homes um, and they thought that they could lease, us, lease the apartments to us at a moderate um, uh, price. So it's not, they are not bridging the gap between what the tenant pays and what they get as, uh, as rent. But, but yes, uh, accepting uh, a, lower, a lower market price. And on and on the good side for them was the uh, guarantee that they would get the uh, rents uh, paid every month and that they would, would keep uh, the apartments in, in good shape and that we return them to the owners also also in good shape. So that was a very good strategy and um, that's carry on by uh, by a very diverse group of uh, people that uh, come from different backgrounds and different uh, expertise. Uh, there's people that, uh, like me, have worked in the real estate and property management market. There are people that have technical skills for uh, the maintenance and the uh, renovation of the apartments. There's uh, social and, and educational uh, work uh, backgrounds as well, and financial expertise. So we really uh, combine uh, all, the, um, all the backgrounds and, and expertise to, to be able to carry on this, this project. So. Um, also, uh, besides securing the lease of apartments, like renting apartments in, in the market, we also started a project of buying uh, apartments as well, buying housing units. Uh, this gives us um, more sustainability in the long term because uh, leases tend to be short term and we can now guarantee a continuity. So uh, first with La Casha and later on uh, with uh, Institute Cat uh, Cat Catalan Institute of Finance, through an agreement with the uh, Catalan Agency of Housing that allows social organizations to get credits uh, to, to buy apartments. So we've been uh, using this line of credit uh, a lot. And together with, uh, with this bank finance, we have now 91 uh, uh, housing units, 91 apartments that Habitat 3 owns and, and also uh, contributes them to, to projects, uh, mainly to the projects with uh, social organizations. So when we get the apartment, we either buy it or we lease it, uh, we rehabilitate it when, when needed, and we do this through social enterprises that try and employ people that have difficulty to access uh, the job market. So that's also a contribution and, and a social value. And then once, uh, once they're ready, we make them available to either social organizations or city councils that, uh, that we work with. Uh, we manage the property, we take care of maintenance, we do everything involved with uh, charging rents and paying uh, owners. And um, as I was saying before, we provide support to the tenants, either uh, through our support team or through social organizations that are expert in different areas such as mental health or uh, uh, disabilities or um, drugs or, or any other um area of, of special vulnerability um so this is basically our 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 project how we go about it and and probably later on we can uh, answer some more questions uh definitely so uh let me give the floor as well to to Peta, perhaps to bring uh in a little bit the perspective of what the administration is trying is trying to to do uh to at least think about some of the issues we were mentioning about the affordability of housing uh, and perhaps give a perspective not just about uh, the specificities on how to help particular people but also uh, perhaps broader perspective on, on how the policies are directed both to the people and to the overall uh, development of the city of Barcelona in that, in that case. Uh, so Peter, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, let me start by thanking uh, Utopia and also Pompeu Fabra University for uh, inviting us in Casol to, to, to take part in this debate and explain our projects and our uh, programs that, that deal with these issues that are so important. Uh, as you said, jo uh, Joan, 
probably I, I will be uh, taking a step back and giving a, a broader view to to the policy as a whole in in terms of housing and also in neighborhood policy. Um, I think that we could all agree that uh, housing is the key element that defines uh, that defines the livability of a, of a district of a neighborhood. And and since housing is is the key element that defines this this these uh, districts, um, we have to to uh, make sure that all districts can uh, still house people and and don't empty out uh, those those residents. And through dynamics of of uh, either market or urban renewal that move uh, or that push out people, residents from these districts. So. Uh, in order to to make livable uh, districts, we need to have livable housing in these districts, and providing livable um, and affordable housing, it's uh, it's a policy that concerns many areas. It's not just the 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 promotion and development of new housing blocks, or providing uh, the two examples that Rosa and Natalia explained us as two. Uh, sectoral policies that tackle different uh, issues or targets of 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 needs and and demand of affordability. We need to provide a, a broader combination of policies. Otherwise, we won't succeed. And I'm a developer. I work for the developer that promotes social housing and affordable housing. And we are extremely conscious that 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 with our policy, we won't be able to make the difference that we need. So. As, and I will speak in terms of the policy of the government, not just cattle and government, but also re, uh, central government Spain, but also local governments all around metropolitan areas in, in Catalonia. Uh, there, there should be, oh, there has to be a combination and starting to be a combination of policies and policies that come from, uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, that provides incentives to, to owners uh, in order to 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 make more affordable housing, or enforces owners through, for instance, price regulation, which is a hot topic now in Spain. Uh, central government has decided to, or at least has has explained that it's going to be implementing a, a housing, uh, a rental housing uh, cap on prices, and and actually this is a policy that regional government Catalonia has also started. Uh, recently, in, in the last um, few months, uh, in order to cap the 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 increment, the, the, the rising prices of, of of rental housing, that this policy alone won't won't be won't be sufficient. We need also to have incentives in order to provide new housing because we know that we need we need both the construction of new housing, but also we need the renewal of of the air, urban areas. So. Uh, in order to that, we have to, to create an environment that's uh, favorable to all sorts of developers, not just private developers, but also uh, non-profit developers that need to, to be able to find land, for instance, in order to promote their housing uh, blocks, but also limited profit, which is a, is, a, is a sort of company that we don't have much experience here in Spain, but other... Um, um, I would say other experiences in Europe have uh, extensive background of, of that key element of the limited profit corporations linked to um, unions, linked to banks, uh, insurance companies that want to provide housing and get a minimum um, uh, return on their investments, but at the same time provide housing for, for citizens as a whole. And I'm thinking of the, by, uh, of the Vienna experience as as a key example of that and and all the policies uh of course direct promotion i mean we we need to as well public sector promote construct develop new housing units uh because um, we have to pitch in as well in in order to 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 make our, our part of the effort and there's where incascal appears uh which i'll explain later how how we we do with we deal with that uh direct promotion and and we have to to set the agreements with local governments in order to to be able to provide that housing because one of the things that we don't have to forget is that 
in order to be able to have a new block of housing, you have to construct it and it takes three years, two years, depends on how good you are on that. But also you need to develop the land where you will be promoting that building, we're constructing that building. And promoting land, it's extremely costful. It costs a lot of money, especially in, in the last 20 years, rise, uh, the, the, there's been a steady rise of prices of land development because of the standards we demand, the, the sustainability that we demand, the, the, the need for new issues that to be implemented in the land that will allow those housing to be sustainable and to be uh, had a lower impact on the environment and, and uh, a better um, living conditions for the residents of those housing. So land development is expensive and land is a scarce good as, uh, as economics uh, professor will would tell us, uh, John, uh, land in theory it's uh, it's it's not a it's not a scarce good, but in reality, in market, it's extremely scarce. Barcelona, for instance, is the second most dense city in in Europe, and it has a, a, a clear issue of where do we have land to develop that housing that we need to make in order to make it affordable and it, to influence market. Uh, providing a, a lower price, but that, that's the, the, one of the key issues, la land development. So now I'll go to what Incasol does. Incasol it is, a, is a developer for the regional government. We are land developers. Mainly we started as industrial land development. Today we are celebrating our 40 years of history, so we have quite a history. We were uh, created right at the beginning of the, of the devolution of powers in, in Catalonia in 1980, where we were um, the second body of the regional government to be instituted. We were a company at the beginning, and now we're a, a, a public company. And uh, we started developing land for industrial uh, activities. Then we introduced other fields of action as land for residential uses. And also we started promoting housing. And we became the, the housing developer for the regional government. So we have constructed over the last 40 years, 37,000 units in our Catalonia. Those 37 housing units, uh, slightly less than half are for rental. The others were for promoted for uh, selling. So they were privatized now, but they still, some of them or most of them are still uh, on, on, on housing um, market uh, as social housing. So they, their tenants have to be, even if it's privately owned, they have to be all the time. Uh, uh, eligible for, for those social housing standards. And then we have 15,000 units uh, in rental market at social prices. Mainly today directed to uh, housing emergency. That, 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 that's one of the things that the, the economic crisis uh, um, uh, brought us was that our housing units that were directed to to make it affordable to, to, to lower income uh, uh, parts of society, the, the crisis made it housing so difficult, so scarce and social situations so desperate that gradually almost all of that 15,000 units have been used to tackle emergency housing for people who were evicted from, from their homes for foreclosure, as, as Natalia explained or people who, for any given reason, have, have had a need and they are not able to, to pay, not even the social price, and they have to be subsidized almost uh, in, in an in a almost total way of their, their rents. And that's the, as our housing stock, 15,000. Uh, 15, During that period of time, those 40 years, we also uh, intervened in 27 neighborhoods that we have redeveloped. Some of them we have remodeled completely. We've demolished the whole district because of, of um, problems in the infrastructure of the buildings that they had uh, structural problems that they had to, re re the, to demolish and rebuild. Those were social housing at the beginning. And we had to do that policy for many years and we rebuilt 9,600 units uh, in those districts. And so in some other districts we have had a more uh, integral approach and we have had policy of of urban intervention that had some renewal but as the, as the same time there was a broader policy of the of the regional government called the neighborhood uh, better neighborhood district better neighborhood program that um, had an integral approach and in in those programs we intervened in specific actions uh, 
in reconstructing some of the areas or maybe providing new square or providing space for new uh, facility, public facility. And those 40 years have led us to today where we are trying to promote new housing intensively. Intensively in the terms of the ability of public sector today, which is a small and we can provide, we are programming now 500, 500 units every year. So we, every year we add 500 units to the, that amount that we have we're promoting those units and now we're starting to build we started this program four years ago and we have first constructions on the go and we have 30 projects on on schedule now and we're adding more or less eight nine projects a year with that amount of 500 units to tackle the affordable rental market exclusively it's not it's not policy for um, emergency housing it's not policy for co-housing. It's it's a specific target which is making affordable to people who have jobs but cannot access the market because market is is so hot in some so, some areas that prices price out them directly. They, they they are priced out. So I think that I'm overextend maybe on my time, but uh, I'm free and I and happy to to answer any question you would like to make us. So, I'm, I'm, uh, so we're going to come back to some of the many issues that, uh, that the three of you uh, raised. Uh, let me perhaps uh, throw in a, a question actually to the three of, of you, which is in some sense sort of the basic question an economist would, would ask, right? Which is why the private sector uh, does not have the incentives to provide uh, the housing for, for many, given that uh, prices are high and so potentially uh, benefits from uh, building new houses or uh, um, uh, repairing the ones uh, that exist or trying to find, uh, uh, find the ones that are empty uh, are huge given the high uh, prices. Why is it that the private sector cannot or is not doing enough of that, right? And in what sense, uh, what uh, public policy or uh, social uh, institutions uh, can do that the private sector uh, does not do. Right? Uh, so I don't know if, uh, who would like to uh, be first in trying to address this, this question, but uh, feel free to, to step in. I don't know, um, maybe. You, you can start, start it up, uh, start then and I'm then sure. You, you, you probably can say things that, I, that I'm not uh, expert on. But I would start by saying that, that there's a limited supply of land and that limited supply of land takes you to a limited supply of housing promoted. And since we are in a market economy uh, and there's a limited supply of housing, you can have a certain amount of housing and, and those who can pay more raise prices up because there's just so much uh, that, that amount of housing. And I'm not saying that we should move to uh, unlimited supply of land, which is a strategy that Spain started in 1998, I think, with the regional, with the central government in, in with the right, that opened up land, and that directly doesn't have the, that effect. But uh, I think that that limited supply of of of, of housing uh, combined with the attractiveness of housing as an investment, both for locals, but also for international corporations that invest enormous amounts of money, not just for owning and getting into the housing uh, rental market, but just for, uh, for uh, owning assets as an investment uh, compared to stock, uh, stock market, which has limited returns on the overrun. Uh, housing has demonstrated in the, in developed countries to have enormous returns because of those high, those raising prices. So there's a combination of factors that, from a, I would say from a macroeconomic perspective, that give an incentive to prices stay high and, and developers seek that uh, that uh, high rental and high profitable markets of of development. I don't know. 
Uh, that's my approach. Natalia, wanna wanna add something? I, I definitely agree that one of the issues at stake is the inequality, right? Uh, uh, the market can provide something for the average consumer, but uh, naturally that doesn't include taking into account the uh, inequalities that the market sometimes uh, creates, right? I don't know if Natalia or Rosa wants to uh, add something. Well, I would like to point out that we have a history of uh, housing policy over the uh, past uh, decades that has relied very heavily on the purchase of, of property, on the purchase of housing. So um, most every um, housing policy has been devoted to the promotion of, uh, even in the social area, even in the um, um, as in the ambit of uh, making housing available for those who couldn't afford the market, uh, it was thought and it was planned and it was subsidized so people would buy. And, and that's, um, that's been one of the uh, reasons that we do not have a stock of social housing that could be devoted to renting. It's only in the last uh, 10, 15 years that this has shifted a bit and, and public administrations have started to the thing that maybe building for renting uh, was a social housing policy worthy of consideration. Also, uh, altogether, we've been a, a country of homeowners uh, uh, as a whole. We have probably one of the highest rates of uh, home ownership in the entire uh, European Union. So I think this is uh, uh, somewhat uh, defined how the housing market works. And, and Pira was, was saying something which is very interesting. In other countries, there are not just much more um, companies that own housing stock and have a, a steady supply of, uh, of rental units that can contribute to level the market. But also there are non-profit or moderate profit organizations that also invest in housing as a long-term and, uh, and rental market, while here the investment on housing has always been or, or mostly been for, for selling and for short term uh, benefits. So, so we have a, a very, very limited amount of housing um, stock devoted to rental as a general as a general thing. And then we have a very, very limited amount of uh, social housing stock devoted to rental so that that I think uh, gives an understanding of why we are where we are that we have uh, we have no particular and not not much housing stock to to, to work with and as as uh, Peter also was saying uh, there's the uh, off uh, supply and demand so if we were able to uh, flood the market with uh, housing units uh, the market would go down and and so that's that's a bit the uh, the challenge uh, how how to provide the market with enough uh, supply of rental housing, the so prices will necessarily come down. And then we could tackle those who still get uh, no chances to, to access those units. Uh, Rosa, you wanted to add something perhaps? Um, yes, uh, I you know I totally agree with, uh, with what Pera and Natalia are talking about. I think, I think the latest figure I saw, there was something like 80% of people in Spain own their homes. What that means is that we have the idea of home property belongs to me, private property. It's an investment. I then sell it. I make more money. I pass it on to my children, etc. And uh, that's a mentality issue. And that needs to change. Uh, not just from investors, but also I, I believe that from people themselves. There's another issue that Pera talked about, which is land, and you know, obviously the the problem uh, that housing co-housing co-ops have is access to land. Um, I believe that the cost of land is about forty percent of the actual cost of your home. So I think better, more or less. So imagine if you take that out of the equation, that, that cost, we would make housing a lot more affordable. And that's one of the ways in which the Barcelona City Council is working. I understand, obviously, that, that you know, land availability is, well, land is scarce. But um, what the, the, the Council of Barcelona is doing is promoting, they believe in the co-housing 
the, the co-housing idea, the co-housing way of living, and they promote co-housing as a way to increase the public housing stock then, and a way to give the uh, answer to the housing emergency. They follow a model called ANDL that it's imported from Scandinavian countries. It's really well established in places like Denmark. Uh, um, and here we call it right of use or assigned uh, for use. Basically, it's a public, uh, public plot of land or a building, but let's say it's a plot of land, and the, the city council gives it to a housing co-op. The housing co-op pays a fee over a number of years. They have the right to use it for 75 years, extended to 90, okay? They build their housing co-op and everyone who lives there has the right to live in, in their homes, but they don't own the flat, okay? The whole building belongs to the co-op. So it's, a, it's another way of, of viewing. Um, of viewing. Uh, it's, it's, it's not renting, it's not home owning. It's being able to use your home uh, for as long as you want to live there. Once those 75 years extend, well, 90 years are up, in theory, the city council will recover the land with the building. So uh, the benefit for the city council, obviously, is that land remains public. Um, and the benefit for the co-housing co-op is that, you know, that it allows people to live in a stable way for over a number of, of years. Also, they... Because, you know, obviously over 90 years that, that building will be paid, they can then use that money to kind of build other co other other co-housing. So that's one of the that's one of the alternatives and that's one of the ways in which we could make housing more more affordable. And another thing that I wanted to say, uh, which Natalia talked about, co-housing caters for uh, for more like the middle middle sort of down middle class so it is i mean it is increasingly a problem for what Peter said people who have jobs uh, who still cannot uh, afford afford uh, a home so we we cater for more that that kind of um or that that sector of society and i think i think Another thing that I wanted to mention, which maybe Pera and Natalia can also clarify, but I believe that one of the problems that Spain had with social housing is that after 20 years, the, it expired. So it wasn't after 20 years, a house that was social housing or was in the social housing market became part of the free market. So that means that we have about two, three percent on your social housing compared to other countries in which the social housing say label or condition didn't expire. I don't know if Pera can can answer that. And also I saw that you know you were Yeah. Uh, can I join? Sure, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, starting from the begin from the, the end uh, of the question, yes, the, the the housing regulation in Spain but also in Catalonia. Has, has led to these social units built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, to uh, gradually leave the social housing uh, condition uh, and be part of the, of the, of the private market uh, housing. And, and that's, a, that's, that's ex extremely uh, um, pitiful because uh, one of the things that happened is that Spain in the 50s and 60s built thousands of social housing thousands. Uh, Franco regime uh, created a society of owners. And that's, that connects with my reflection on, on that, that I want to make to both of your interventions, Natalia and Rosa, is that uh, we have a mentality of ownership, right? I think we could agree that, but also I would say that we have had political incentives in order to create that mentality. If you have the right incentives, you have owners, which is what Franco did. What Franco wanted owners because owners don't uh, make revolts; they are they are uh, socially stable. And if you um, factory worker, you convert factory workers into owners of housing. You have factory workers who become uh, uh, property managers. No, that that's a, that's the CK that was behind the, the strategy of Franco regime. And we, as a country, we haven't questioned that until recently, as, as, as Natalia said. In the last 15 years, things have changed towards housing rental in the social promotion sector. But until then, 
we promoted, and it was expected from the society that we promoted for 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 purchase, not for rental social housing. And I think that's a question of incentives. If society had in the private sector incentives in order to promote social house uh, uh, rental market, we would have more rental market. But we don't. We haven't had that that, that set of incentives actually until now, 19, 2011, I think. It was subsidized buying a house for everyone, no matter how much rent you had. You had that subsidy. It was insane. I mean, middle income and high income rent uh, families had the subsidy from the state on their mortgage in order to to promote uh, uh, purchase of housing, which is inexplicable unless you want a society of owners, which is and and uh, at a strong and uh, the most develop a uh, construction sector in Europe, which is what we had until 2008, nine, probably, right? That's it. That's my comment. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Let me uh, move the discussion uh, or follow up the discussion, but move it to a particular uh, questions that, that came to my mind while, while you were uh, talking. And in particular, it seems that you, uh, the three of you sort of agreed that, uh, uh, that housing supply was limited in, in many ways. Um, obviously, housing supply depends on finding the uh, adequate land uh, to, to build, but uh, it's not just a, a two-dimension aspect, right? Height uh, plays an important role in how much uh, housing can be de developed in a plot of land, right? And if we're to compare cities in the U.S., uh, cities uh, in Europe, uh, cities in uh, places where the, the, the supply of landing is even more limited, like Singapore uh, or many other uh, Asian countries, we've seen that the solution elsewhere, not in Europe, has been to uh, develop uh, taller and taller buildings. Um, so I don't know what's your view on this potential uh, solution. Uh, perhaps connected to this is, uh, uh, you talked about uh, social housing uh, in different parts of, of the city, but uh, not really in connection to uh, uh, mobility inside the city. So perhaps you want to also uh, address these issues at the same time as talking about uh, height in European cities. So, uh, I'm not sure who wants to start. Uh, Natalia, this time it's, it's your turn to start. Perhaps Natalia, if you want to <laughs> I don't start. know. <laughs> got the microphone. Uh, I think there were uh, a, a number of questions, and uh, if, if you could sort of uh, perhaps uh, let's, let's break it down the questions. So let, let me yeah, first uh, uh, let me first focus on uh, on the issue about. Uh, housing supply and whether height is a viable option for uh, European cities. Also, with uh, uh, having in mind uh, that we're uh, thinking about uh, providing housing for uh, uh, for a segment of the market that may not be the high income market. Uh, so, to what extent uh, increasing the limits on the height that buildings may have. Uh, may have an effect on the total supply of housing and to what extent this is, this is or is not a viable option uh, for the segments of the housing market that, that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Well, I think in, in Barcelona, before uh, considering heightening the buildings, there are many options uh, available. They are uh, the ground floors of many buildings. There are buildings that had a former use that could be restudied. And I think these options probably uh, would make no sense if what we were thinking was increasing the private market supply at high end rates of the market. But reconsidering our uh, urban policies as far as uh, how much you can build in a building, only if those uh, resulting units could be devoted to affordable or social housing might be something to, to think about. So. Um, before, before my, my perspective, and this is very personal, but my perspective before thinking of putting two or three stories up in the Echample is to look for uh, many buildings that have had a prior use 
that cannot be turned into sort of regular housing. But maybe if provision was made that that housing uh, to come after that, to come out of that would be affordable or social, these, these regulations might be rethought and, uh, and, and re evaluated. No, Rosa, Peter, you want to add something Rosa? to that? I, I, I thought, okay. Uh, density, which is the concept behind what you, you proposed, Joan, is it, let's increase density in our cities. Well, Barcelona is one of the densest cities in the world, in the developed world. That's, let's start for that. It's dense because we occupy the land intensively. Our streets are narrow compared to the height of our buildings. The Champla is an example. Uh, we could build higher, but then the tension of our public space would be enormous. And, and we live in a city which has some Mediterranean values to it, which are the livability of the space, the public space. And if you increase to a certain amount that density through high rise buildings, you can put extreme pressure pressure sorry on on that on that public space but not also public space as a facility also all the other facilities you need also space for schools you need a space for uh, health centers and and that's not the, the amount of facilities you can have in a given area district neighborhood it's limited i, I would say that there's room for higher density in certain parts of Barcelona. I totally agree with Natalia. There's, there's room for improvement in the use of the built infrastructure we already have. So we can read, but I don't, I don't see how it, more density to Barcelona city center, for instance, would change housing. I think there are other policies. Then there's a reflection. We haven't talked about pandemic, COVID so far, but density and COVID are a big issue now in urban, planning debate uh, uh, forum, right? And it's not clear, we, we still not, don't know enough about COVID and how it works to have a strong views on how density promotes uh, contagious uh, of, 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 the, of the pandemic. So it's complicated now to defend more density than we have already, right? And I would, it's, it's a diversion in terms of reflection, but I would think of housing as the, the small uh, part of the welfare state that in Spain, for instance, we haven't developed. I, if you reflect housing as a right, uh, as, as it is education, health, pensions, and unemployment rights, and you add housing as another right opposable that you can demand to the state we can reflect in a different way of how we should finance from public sector all these policies we've been talking about and starting from land but if, if we don't approach that the right of housing it's essential it's a keystone for living conditions then we we are not we, we are we allow ourselves to think of market as an instrument to provide that housing and we don't do that with healthcare. We, we don't allow our society to let healthcare only on the hands of markets. That's why do we do that with housing? That's a reflection we should approach probably and have with that thought, the new policies that we should pr promote maybe. And that's my, my, my view. Sorry, Rosa, I, 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 I diverted a little from the- Oh, great. <laughs> No, basically, what I was going to say something very similar to Pera that, you know, to sort of build up, it's not always possible because, you know, for those people who, you know, if you have a building like this and then you're going to build this, for those people, you need services like schools and, and health centers. And also, I believe that for each square meter that you build as housing, you also need green spaces in Barcelona. So that's just not always a possibility because building up... <laughs> doesn't give you more space down like these green spaces that I'm that I'm talking about. So it's it is not the, the solution. It cannot be. One of the things that could be done is um I don't know how to how, how it says in English, but the land we have recalificate uh, uh, right now, you know, there's there's bits of land which are industrial. So for example, a neighborhood like Poblano, a lot of it it's industrial sites. 
and you're not supposed to, to build in there. So you could change that qualification of the land. And that's one of the things that the council is actually doing in the north of uh, Poblano in Provençals. Uh, this area, they were gonna dedicate 10% of the land to housing, and now they've changed it to 30%. So that I, that is an uh, an improvement. That's a way of uh, of you know making the housing stock well, the, the, the making it larger the the housing stock that that we have. And yeah, in terms of I mean, I think we always go back to the same issue that Peter was talking about housing as a right. So I think that is a debate that we're having right now, uh, housing as a commodity and housing as a right. And more and more like big corporations have gotten into housing and into human rights. So they just don't match. I mean, if you want sustainable and inclusive housing, you cannot have a view that housing is, is for profit because just from, say, from an ecological point of view, if someone wants to make profit from a home, they're not going to choose the best materials that are sustainable, et cetera, because they're more expensive. Generally, they don't have that in mind. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to rent their homes at an affordable price because they want to make money. So I think it just, we go back to, to that thing. And, and recently we... We organized the forum, and Leilani Farha, which is the ex uh, relator for United Nations uh, Right of Housing, she gave a very interesting talk. And she said, Well, imagine that in a society we say, Well, 50% of people can't vote, not because of their age, just because, you know, out of everyone who can vote, 50%, everyone would say, well, how come? I mean, this is a human right. Why can't they vote? But it seems that we're not yet done this click with housing. And if, if, you know, obviously, I believe that everyone thinks like me, but then if I talk to, uh, I don't know, friends uh, and other people, they just don't, don't see it that way. And I think we need to somehow start changing people's mentality. And I know it's a, it's a long way to go because of what we've been talking about, like the tradition of home owning and, and you know, it just, but it, you know, it doesn't mean that it cannot, it cannot happen if we, if we carry on work, uh, working in, in, in this area. Mm -hmm. Just a, a last comment on your first question, whether the um, private sector has or has not incentive. Uh, all these thousands and thousands of uh, social housing units that were built in this country over the uh, last uh, seven to eight decades, they had subsidies and they had incentives by the policymakers. Only the policy was aimed at ownership. So we have to understand that social and affordable housing not necessarily and it's not most of the times profitable for the market to do it so what we can do is shift the policy we understand that uh, there's a need for a housing policy and there there's a need for subsidies the idea would be to to uh, incentivize um, the building of um, housing units for the rental market on the long term on a particular set of criteria uh, relating to price. And that would probably induce many, many builders to, 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 to you know, uh, consider uh, building housing for, for the rental uh, purpose on, on the long term and, and on affordable prices. And, and with that in mind, then having, uh, setting aside chunks of that for the most vulnerable would be probably easier. So let me, um, so you've talked about uh, uh, the uh, housing market as essentially having uh, two parts, uh, home ownership, which uh, is uh, extremely prevalent uh, in Spain, and then the rental market. Uh, that was probably true up until uh, 10 years ago uh, when uh, platforms uh, like Airbnb entered the market uh, and created a large market for short-term uh, rentals that is particularly prevalent in places like uh, Barcelona, but not only Barcelona, uh, Paris, uh, Rome, uh, many European cities uh, are facing this, uh, this challenge. Uh, in what ways do you think, uh, on the one hand, that these platforms uh, and these new forms of rental are affecting the market? And second, what should uh, policymakers do and how uh, you as a, uh, 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 a non-private sector participants 
uh, are dealing uh, with, uh, with this issue. Well, I can start if you want. Um, well, I think obviously, I mean, the typical thing is it's affecting the market because obviously like if you've got lots of flats that are made for tourists, that means that there's less for the people who live here. And I think I, I heard a statistic that I have to check that um, it said that in El Bor neighborhood in the center of Barcelona, 80% of flats are tourist flats. And that's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, flats that are not dedicated to people who live here on a permanent on a permanent basis, and I think that obviously then has other you know there has other it has other consequences for the sustainability of of cities, for example, in terms of like services, in terms of shops, you know, and and the, and the kind of uh, local economy that that we that we have. And I'm just wondering right now with the with this whole pandemic, what's happening, you know, with these with these uh, tourist floods are sitting there empty. And I saw recently that I think I don't know if, if Natalia maybe can complement that. I saw that the the Barcelona City Council was giving incentives to rent those people as uh, to those flats to people in emergency situations. And I think it was only 22 flats that were that, that entered this this kind of program. So that you know that's telling us that you know that they're still like holding on to this idea or this we are holding on to this idea that once the pandemic is over obviously everything will be you know we'll go back to normal business as normal but we we will see and and in terms of uh, thinking about empty flat which is one of the things that i believe habitat 3 does um just i'm just thinking about all these flats that right now empty and how if there is a way of how this can go back into into the the normal rental market um i don't know if anyone else wants to well, just to answer your question yes the city council reached an agreement with the um tourism um harm and um lobby and uh and yes there are 22 apartments that it's the beginning of the project but there are more uh, that have been agreed upon Okay. And, and this is uh, um, a trend that we see, I mean, uh, on, on the late, uh, probably couple of uh, two to three months uh, ago, we, we've seen more owners of uh, apartments that have been devoted to tourism that consider uh, leasing them to us or to other people on a longer term basis, uh, obviously at a different price that they, that they do uh, when they rent it to tourism. And that's... Uh, that's a key, that's a key question. When someone has an apartment and is in the market, and it's rented to a family that is going to live on a regular basis, uh, it reaches a price, uh, a maximum price. When when you pay for an apartment on a week base or on a two or three day days base, uh, the the market would would go higher. Uh, one thing is how these apartments enter into the market and, and whether they have to have a license or not. And, and a lot has been done in that department on regulating that. So if I cannot lease an apartment, if I don't have a board of uh, habitability or I have all my papers, but I can put my apartment in B&B and not even um, prove that I'm the owner, uh, this makes a substantial impact in the uh, in how things are uh, are dealt with. So. Um, the increase in regulation is a good thing. And, and I think that one of the things that we are seeing uh, because of the pandemic is um, a question on how the, this tourism model is going to evolve in the future and whether this tourism model is going to be sustainable on the long term. So there's an impact, a clear impact uh, now. I mean, the tourism as we knew it, uh, is, is changed completely. The weekend uh, ex excursion to a city in, in Europe to, to stay a couple of days on an Airbnb apartment is completely stopped now. But is it going to affect the tourism model on the long term? What's the city we want and how do we want to combine the enrichment of people coming and visiting us with the um, uh, undesired effects of neighborhoods uh, surrendering and, and becoming ghost cities because uh, everyone that is there is, is not from Barcelona. So I think this is an interesting um, discussion that we will uh, have more in, in the near future, see how, how 
tourism, even hotels, business hotels. Uh, what we've discovered with the pandemic is that we are having this conversation online, that we don't have to fly to Los Angeles to have a business meeting. So many business hotels are going to have to redefine their business model. And from that, things can happen. And maybe turning into different investments, maybe getting some incentives to turn that into affordable housing. That's a question that I'm putting forward, but I think we'll be hearing more about that in the near future. I don't know if Tera wants to add something to... Well, uh, yes, um, John. I, I think that, that mainly you have um, um, comment all the, the, the relevant aspects. Definitely there's been a, we, we have detected uh, a slow, uh, slowing da of the of the price in rental in Barcelona, slightly, already, and it's connected to some transfer. Some we still don't have the numbers, but there's a transfer of, of some of the housing that was uh, rented through Airbnb and such platforms to to rental market, and this has an effect. But also, uh, on the long run, we don't know yet and owners don't know yet they they i think for now they're waiting hotel owners as well as as, as natalia said the the hotel stock in cities as barcelona but paris london that have uh, 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 an enormous market uh, oriented to tourism uh, they will be rethinking probably if if tourism can cannot come back exactly as it was so we will see changes i think and I think regulation is, is the key issue to this. One of the problems with public sector in general, everywhere, almost everywhere, is that we, we tend to be always on the run behind uh, new developments. So no one expected Airbnb. No, no one expected Airbnb. So now we had, had Airbnb for 10 years. Now we have a set of regulations that allow us to control. A little, not not completely, but maybe in five year times we will be able to control properly, and no owner, no not fake owner or no, uh, no uh, breaking of the, those regulations will, will will happen. But something new will come over probably. Uh, we, we have the ability, a limited ability to regulate market in that sense, and. Yeah, let's be hopeful on this. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, let me, so many of you have hinted at something that's been lurking uh, behind, which is obviously the current pandemic. Uh, I've avoided uh, explicitly mentioning, uh, mentioning <laughs> it uh, to give room for uh, sort of uh, combining it with, uh, with the future of housing, right? So how do you see uh, the pandemic affecting housing, affecting the incentives uh, for people to travel, uh, the incentives to, for people to live close to city centers, as has been the case, uh, and how this can be perhaps used as an opportunity uh, for uh, people most directly concerned about affordable uh, housing uh, to take advantage of the situation. Uh, and really step in in ways that were uh, perhaps unthinkable uh, just uh, six months ago. Uh, so. uh, can I start now? Sure. I, I'll start the first in this one. All right. I, I think uh, it depends, as I said just a few minutes ago, it depends a lot on, on, on the development of the pandemic. I see and my bet is that everything will be back to normal in a certain way once the pandemic gets internalized as the whole globe uh, has 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 gone through it we will sort of be, be we'll be back on 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 many of the things that we had before tourism for instance will be one offices uh, i'm now standing in an office that used to house 50 people in just this floor and now we're six people but I see in the future the, 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 the positive externalities of being together coming back. So uh, in terms of work, things will be gradually, I think, normally getting back to normal. And in terms of housing, 
now we see a trend of people leaving cities and going back to 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 areas where they perceive they have more space in terms of those confinement periods that we are experiencing again now but on the long run the positive externalities of being all together in terms of housing as well the, the services you get when you live uh, in a in a in a dense area will out uh, outnumber the the, the 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 problems that you create when you live all in aggregated uh, fashion because as a human society we've gone through this sort of process of of being in pandemics in in many centuries actually in last century we had a enormous pandemic and cities went back to normal business is normal uh, uh, that's my my that's completely personal I have no data on that all right <laughs> that's my, my that's completely my view but maybe further perhaps uh, natalia or rosa are you taking advantage of the situation to uh, for particular projects uh, that you're putting in place uh, these days? Uh, well, I can, I can say, well, I think with the, um, with the pandemic, I think what it's shown is uh, a lot of time that the deficiencies of, of our homes uh, in terms of quality, for example, the lack of lighting, the lack of ventilation, in some cases overcrowding, in some cases extreme overcrowding. And I think that it will somehow change the relationship and the idea that we have for what our homes are. We've never spent so much time at home. We've never made, not just spend time at home, but we call it intensive use of housing uh, of your home. So your home was a school, your home was work, your home was the gym, your home was a workshop place. And, and I think that has had an impact on how people view, view their homes. So in terms of, um, of our projects, um, it has obviously, I, I mean, uh, to me, this kind of works in, in our favor. And uh, from the point of view of architectural, I'm not, I, I'm not an architect, but architecturally co-housing buildings are uh, uh, built with people at the center and the health of people, both physical and, and also um, mental. Uh, so the, the whole issue about having communal spaces, I mean, that's one of the things that people have suffered the most, I would say, not even having a balcony. And after the pandemic or during the pandemic, you know, in, in, the, in the portals where people search for like rental house, look, you know, homes, you know, the, the selection criteria, home with a balcony or a terrace became top. Uh, and in a, in a co-housing, one of the benefits that it has, it has this, this, um, these communal areas. If you read, you know, there's been articles uh, written about people who've lived the confinement in, a, in, a co in co-housings and their experience has been very different uh, because they've had contact with people. And I think that takes me to another thing, uh, which is, I think the pandemic has also shown how atomized we live, how, you know, how individualized society is and how we really need each other. And we need to talk to each other, we need the social contact, and we need networks of support. Uh, in in, in co-housing, that just happens naturally. And I think in, in that sense, uh, it benefits, and we've had more interest in, in, in our projects as a, as a result. Well, as I was saying, we've uh, seen an increase of offers. So when we started uh, searching empty homes from, from private owners, mostly they were closed uh, homes that were not fit to be rented. And, and we would help uh, the program with the city council allows from some funds to advance the money for the renovation. And uh, people that were not in the market because it was probably their own home or the home of a family member, it had been closed for a while. And, and gradually and very intensively after the pandemic, we've seen homes that would be on the market, but the owners choose to uh, opt for this uh, more guaranteed uh, option. And uh, so, so in a way, we are taking advantage of that. And, and Commenting on what you both said on, on how we understand our relationship with our homes, I think the pandemic has also uh, brought to the table the inequality of the homes, the homes that are not um, 
so fit for use the homes that need a lot of uh, energy and money to to be warm and to be comfortable so we get into the issues like uh, energy poverty and 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 how we have to think um, our future homes and our future social homes so uh, uh, economic uh, sorry energy poverty is not an issue another big thing that has been uh, brought up with the pandemic is the digital gap we are having this conversation online. Rosa was saying uh, our homes are our schools, our homes, our offices and everything. Uh, all the many homes that have no access to internet, to uh, they don't have uh, uh, more than an, that, that a phone to, to connect and to more and more uh, public uh, situation and, and documents and papers are being dealt with digitally. So that that creates another gap of inequality with those who um, are in a in a most vulnerable position. So so I think this is something we also have to think about, and I think the pandemic has been like a big lens that would have done. It hasn't changed things, but it has put things into a new perspective and and right there for us to see them in a in a much more obvious way that we used to see them beforehand. Uh, something that also comes with, with the pandemic, uh, I guess, and something that uh, is related to where social housing may be located is the mobility inside uh, Rasada. So perhaps in the last uh, less than 10 minutes that we have, perhaps we can uh, uh, talk briefly about, about mobility and about how you think about mobility, both in relation uh, to the pandemic uh, and uh, in relation to where to locate uh, housing, uh, social housing within a uh, city like, like Barcelona. But, uh, particularly in a, in a moment where uh, I, I think we just uh, heard that mobility was, is going to be severely restricted. Who we'll starts? Hello? Uh, Tera, you can, you can start. Okay. Uh, well, before the pandemic, one of the things we, we changed in how we develop housing, and I'm speaking as in Casol, is uh, we approach that our, all, all our new projects should be uh, on the urban fabric uh, in all layers of urban fabric. So you have to have, uh, for our new development, to be connected to the services, to be connected to the network public transport, to be accessible. So uh, we changed the approach before the pandemic. And, and because prior to these projects that we started after the, um, the crisis, the, the recession, those issues were less relevant in order to decide where we invest. Now we are more seriously taking uh, those factors in consideration because we think that it, it benefits to all levels of those projects. Where we locate? Well, we locate where people will have a better living condition because they have access to all services they need, uh, education, health, as I said, uh, commercial space, things like that. We choose on based on that, which locations we develop. And, um, and that's from, from one side. The other side is that I think uh, local governments all around the world have changed their approach to public space because of the pandemic and that's one of the greatest things that we have to 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 profit from this terrible times that we live in is that the, the cities are changing a lot public space in cities are changing a lot with lots of debates and with lots of ups and downs and different views but i think those changes are, are here to stay and and we'll we'll consolidate because there's a there's the perception that the need of open space and that space not being for cars, being for people, and allowing people to move in different ways, uh, cycling routes. There was a news yesterday comparing the new network of cycling routes in, in Europe. It is ex it, it's amazing how things have changed and how certain cities haven't done that, but some have. So I think it, it, it definitely it will bring us a major change in that. And I think it's it's just, timing is a matter of timing it came at the moment where the discussion of environment was so uh, on 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 the table at the moment that change uh, arrived because of a crisis which usually happens 
and I don't know, Natalia and Rosa might add something, so I'm sure. Well, um, I think, well, I'm not an expert in mobility, but one of the things that really struck with me was um, how numbers from, from the pandemic showed that the poorest neighborhoods that tend to be, you know, outside of the city were the hardest hit by by the by the, the, the by, by the COVID by COVID, and that was related to taking public transport, having to travel uh, to the to the jobs, and I think that it's, that you know that is in itself a very interesting issue. A lot of the time, as we know, they don't have uh, in these neighborhoods the, the the ability to work telematically, and I think that really talking about inequality and inclusive city that really showed again another type of of inequality that exists and we don't often think about. I mean, in cities like London ask people to go cycling to work when you live in zone six, which is probably like 10 kilometers away. I mean, it's just not, it's just not possible. And I think what it's brought is a, yeah, a sense or like an idea that other types of transport are possible. So like, you know, I love cycling. So for me, it's perfect. More cycling routes, great. And um, Barcelona is a city, like apart from like, you know, the, in the mountain, it's really flat. So, but, also, the Superilla project, which um, I don't know if you know about, is like this. I mean, in Poblano, we have one. There's others in the city where they've, uh, there's a few blocks that have been cut, well, close to traffic, not completely. Some areas are completely pacified, others aren't. And that's really, for us, for me at least, it's, it's really made, made a change in, in the neighborhood. Superillas are a very good way of... Um, of uh, making space in the city that it's for people and not for cars basically and that's and that's how i would i would sum it, sum it up so I, that's that's it for me if natalia wants to add yeah, something natalia, if you want to in the two yeah. minutes more or less because at, at some point we'll have not, to not uh, much on what they've not not much on what they've said and then um, i'm not an expert on mobility so okay so let me perhaps uh, uh conclude uh, this session. So I think it's it's been wonderful to hear uh, different experiences, uh, views on uh, an issue, which is the affordability of housing, uh, not just from uh, sort of a, an abstract uh, perspective, which is perhaps the one I can bring in, uh, but rather from uh, an in-hand uh, experience and a first uh, first-hand experience on, on, on the issues involved in uh, the different aspects uh, surrounding housing, from the different types of uh, housing markets that exist, the incentives for people to own instead of rent, uh, the incentives of uh, uh, private sector uh, developers to perhaps uh, forget about important uh, segments uh, of the market and how uh, this uh, contributes uh, substantially, perhaps, to the inequalities that exist uh, in many cities uh, today, uh, and how sometimes a success story, which has been the, uh, the case for many cities, uh, has many uh, losers uh, behind the scenes that uh, we sometimes uh, tend to, uh, to forget. On this note, uh, and on the hope that the pandemic uh, changes some things for the good, but not for the bad, uh, let me perhaps conclude uh, this uh, discussion uh, by thanking uh, Natalia Martinez from Habitat 3, uh, Rosa Parades from Cohouse, uh, from, uh, I, I see the uh, Cohousing Bazaar because it's a, it's a name that, the, <laughs> that I see uh, there, but from uh, uh, Habitat 8 Impulse and from uh, Pera uh, Picorelli from Incasol. Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing uh, your views, your experiences, your projects, uh, and your passion for solving uh, such an important uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.